Welcome to the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast. As investigators and mediators focused on regulatory and workplace conflicts, we have seen a thing or two and learned a thing or two. In each episode, we will be speaking with industry leaders in regulation, human resources and law, as well as thought leaders and top performers in investigations and mediation. We bring our audience interesting and cutting edge information on conflict management as it relates to professional regulation and workplace disputes. This industry is one of many views and we have to say that some views shared by our guests are not necessarily shared by the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast, its host or sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Bernard and Associates, trusted investigation and mediation professionals since 2004. Now here's your host, Dean Bernard. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the latest edition of the podcast, and thank you for tuning in today. We have a great guest on our show today, Robin Bailey of Aria Benefits. Now, I have to say, having Robin on the show is an extra special treat for me for a few reasons. Robin and I met many years ago when I needed to obtain health and life benefits for my employees, and he was recommended to me as a great advisor. And over the years, he's not only proven to be a great advisor, but he's also become really a trusted advisor and friend and someone I can share ideas with and learn from. And we, you know, we're we're both pretty driven to ensure our businesses succeed and having people in your life who think like you do and who can relate to the effort and the joy involved in building your business and growing it is really a great thing. And one more thing I have to say, Robin has his own podcast that he started a few years ago called Starting With One. And I've had the privilege of being a guest on his show on a couple of occasions. And so it was through that experience that I decided to start my own podcast. Uh, They say, uh, Robin, that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So I I hope you feel (laughs) I love it. (laughs) So Robin's been an amazing resource in helping me get off the ground. And he's got his own unique story that I'd like him to share with our listeners And uh, then we can get into learning some more about, you know, some of the interesting innovations that are happening in the world of group benefits. So with that, Robin, welcome to the show. Well, Dean, thanks so much for having me. And and I got to say, I'm so proud of you because, you know, this, we've chatted about this many times and and a podcast was something I wanted to do. I had no idea how I was going to do it back then. And you were one of the early guests and then a subsequent guest back on the show again. And I remember chatting with you and saying, this is something that's that's really good for a number of reasons. We'll talk about that as we go on through the conversation. And you had chatted about doing it. And to your credit, a lot of people chat about things and there's nothing wrong with chatting about things and having great ideas. But to see you go through and pull the execution, we were chatting about you've done several of these now. And then, and I'm one of your early guests, which is, which is very flattering, but I'm so happy to see you, you do this. Exactly what you said in your intro about we started off as as client and customer relationship, and and we subsequently we've grown into peers, and where we share ideas and eventually became friends. But it's that sharing ideas, which is really why I wanted you to come back on our newest series, Success Leaves Clues, because you're someone, Dean, that I look up to. And you know, it's funny if you're going to work for a living, you might as well enjoy the people that you work with, and that goes for your clients as well. And I remember when we used to drive out to see each other on appointments. I remember looking forward to coming to your office because I knew I was going to, we were going to talk business, you know, the matter at hand, but then we were also going to nerd out on business because as you said, we're both driven about what we're trying to build. And I always left your office feeling excited. And it's those sharing of ideas and really nurturing those ideas and putting them to execution. And you are the perfect example of why I wanted to have you on Success Leaves Clues and the feedback that we get on on your episodes in particular just prove that people love to hear these ideas. So thank you so much for having me on the show. Oh, no, it's it's my pleasure. I'm glad you're here. So I hope your listeners don't mind, but I'm, I'm going to go way back to the beginning because I think it's important about who we are and, and, and who we become in life. And it's funny, as I was listening in, in introduction, I find that I'm really following in my dad's footsteps. And I'll tell you what that means as we get further along, but I'm going to go way back and... I'm going to say that I grew up in this business. You know, my parents came from Scotland and England to the country with nothing. My brother and my sister, and I often joke that I'm the only true Canadian in the family because my brother and sister were both born in England. But when I tell my story about being in the business, 
it is because of my dad. I grew up with insurance. I remember tagging along on a Saturday to the St. Clair office where, where he worked in downtown Toronto. And, you know, it was empty and I'd get on a chair and wheel myself around. But I really did grow up in the insurance business. And, and when I finished university, dad did me really the biggest favor because he had been a broker since he came to Canada. And it was a real tough go is that roller coaster ride of feast and famine. And, you know, my brother tells me stories about you had no idea how close we were to the brink, you know, of many times because it was it's such a tough go. So dad didn't want to see me go through that early on in my career. So he actually got me an interview and he said, you did the rest. I got you the interview and it was to become an employee benefit specialist. And it was a salaried role. And my role was really to be the specialist for other agents and advisors. And it's really one of the best things he ever did for me because it allowed me to learn the business, the inside out, get all my education, and then eventually come over to the broker side of the business. And and dad passed away about six months ago. And it just brings back such fond memories talking about him now, because I remember the time that dad decided, hey, it's time for me to hang up the skates and for you to take over the business. And we had planned a trip back to Dunblane, Scotland, where he had went to school. And I swear, Dean, it was like a MasterCard commercial. It was the 50th anniversary. And all the all the guys he went to school with came back from all over the world. And we're in this tiny little pub at the end of the night. And of course, you know, you can't put one beer down without having another. And I looked over and I'm just having this experience with my dad. And I'm hearing stories that I never heard my entire life, you know, about my dad. So all this mace. And it was just one of those MasterCard commercials. And it's especially now that dad's gone, that has become more of a priceless memory that I have. And it was on that trip where dad said, I think it's time for you to, for you to come in the business. So you and I often talk about this, our purpose and the why behind what we do. I really feel like I have big shoes to fill. And I feel like I'm carrying on his legacy When dad passed away, I put a post on LinkedIn because a lot of people knew him in the industry. And I thought, well, I'm just going to put this out there because maybe there's people that, you know, especially during COVID hadn't heard of the announcement. And I got to tell you, Dean, the outpouring of love and support that came back to me and my family was just incredible. And when I think back about the relationships that dad built over the years, again, it, it makes me think of the relationship because you said it, we became friends. So I'm really following in those footsteps and I'm really proud of what we've been doing. So we're at 2003. I come in and join dad, guys that I had worked with over the years. I'm in the elevator one time with my current business partner and uh, I get in the elevator. And, and of course, when dad had retired, I took over this block of business and he had employee benefit clients and mutual fund clients and life insurance clients. And I get in the elevator one day, and even though I'd done all the, my training for it, I said to a guy I'd worked with, Al, I said, geez, I don't know how you do the individual side. I just don't enjoy it. And he kind of looks at me sideways and says, oh, well, I don't like the group side. So, of course, the light bulb went off. We started dating, as it were. Uh, I, I started looking after his employee benefit clients. He started looking after my life insurance clients. And Al, my business partner, had the best poker face in the business because he kept saying, hey, I think we're on the same page here. We have some alignment in terms of the firm and and how we want to service our clients, but I'm already going down that road. And I knew who Al hung out with. So I had a good idea. And I said, hmm, if it's one person that I'm probably not interested, but if it's this other guy, I'm definitely interested. And of course, Al just kept that straight face. And we eventually had an offsite meeting. And of course, I walk in and there's Joe Ferreira, my partner to this day. And I was in. So We launched Life and Legacy Advisory Group, which is a company brand that is still around today. And it's funny, we we ran with that brand, uh, the three of us building our company, really trying to build something special for our clients. Uh, Table stakes for us in the beginning, Dean, were equal partners in every sense of the word, which meant didn't matter which division did better in a particular year, we all got paid the same. And the reason why we decided that was, we said, we're going to work for the good of the client no matter what. And that will always come back and do good things for us in return. And it always has. So again, that company, that branding has done extremely well in the GTA, especially around the financial planning side, the life and legacy. Of course, leaving that legacy has really always played well into the financial planning side. But it's interesting, back in late 2017, I was preparing for a partner's meeting And I began looking at the numbers and we had built a substantial employee benefits block because I think we do a really good job there for our clients over the years. And I came to the meeting saying to the guys, 
you know, it's funny, we built this great big block. We don't have really branding dedicated to the employee benefits market. And the only place you could really find anything about it was on our website. If you dug into, hey, here's the team and oh, look, that's what Robin does. And I had a half cocked grin on my face. And I said to them, well, what if we actually told people that we did benefits and that we're really good at it? So this is where Aria Benefits was launched. So right now we have two brands, anything on the individual side. So uh, financial planning, estate planning is the life and legacy advisory group. Anything to do with benefits or pensions and stuff like that is ARIA benefits. And we run two brands. So this created a bit of an interesting, I wouldn't say a problem, but what, what ended up happening when we launched that brand is I had some of our clients reaching out and say, oh, did you guys break up? Did Al and Joe? So at the time when I first started ARIA, that's where the podcast came from. Because the Life and Legacy brand had done such a good job of creating a presence and a brand in the GTA that Aria really needed to catch up. So I thought, well, the podcast would be a great way to bring Aria up to speed. And it was interesting. And Dean, I think you've experienced this too with the podcast. So I started the podcast. It was benefits focused. It was called the Benefits Corner at the time and didn't know what I was doing. And I just dove in head first. And I thought, well, maybe my wife will listen to it if, if I'm nice. And I maybe take her for date night. <laughs> Maybe some friends will listen to it and maybe even a couple of clients. And if I have them as a guest, well, that's surely a way to get them to listen. Well, it's interesting, Dean. Within the first week, we were being downloaded in every province in Canada. And I thought, okay, this is a good start. Within the first month, we had expanded into about a dozen U.S. states. And I thought, well, that makes sense because I have colleagues that I deal with on the U.S. side. Okay, so that makes sense. Then we start going into Europe. So England. France, Spain, Italy, Finland, Sweden. Uh, I mean, just bizarre to me, and even into South America. And although I just record the podcast now, and I have people behind the scenes who actually do it for me because we've grown to that level, they still tell me they're routinely surprised about where this podcast is being downloaded. So what's that done for us? It's really caught that brand of Aria up to the where the brand of Life and Legacy was. And then something interesting happened. I love, I love that nothing is stagnant. Things change over time. And to me, that's very exciting. So my business partner on the life and legacy side comes to me one day and he says, I want to do a podcast too, because he had seen what was happening with our podcast and, and it benefiting the ARIA benefit side of the business. And again, we still have that problem of that little bit of a disconnect. Most people understood the two brands, but there's still a little bit of that disconnect. So when Al approached me to do his own podcast, I said, why don't we do one better? Why don't we co-host a show, you know, we, we rename it and have it support both brands. And that's what we've done ever since. And, and that's where you've seen, you've appeared on the Success Leaves Clues series. The, the, the actual podcast is called Starting With One. Um, and we have a Success Leaves Clues series that is doing really well that you've appeared on. And that has worked, I'm going to tell you, magic for our brand because it's out there consistently across every social channel. I have not heard since we've been doing that, anyone ever saying, okay, are you with RA Life and Legacy? They fully understand the company is together. So that's that's been one of the best marketing ideas that we've had that have really cost nothing to do, very low barriers to entry. So I would encourage everyone listening to this, if you've been thinking about a podcast, I'm happy to chat about it. I know Dean is too. For me, it's been something that's been super beneficial for business, but even more so just the conversations that you get to have with people. I mean, just chatting with Dean. And I mean, I'm, I know I'm doing a lot of the, the talking, Dean, so maybe I'm going to stop soon because I want to I have a conversation. But offline, when you and I were setting up this call, I mean, just the opportunity for us to sit down and have that conversation. We're all so busy these days. We just don't get that opportunity anymore. So I would say to people, for people that you know, you like, you trust, and you like having conversations, this is a super excuse to get a one-on-one -on -one conversation that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise get with a person, especially these days when we're not seeing people. And further, if there are people that you want to meet out there that maybe aren't necessarily in your circle, again, the podcast is a great excuse to highlight that guest and really turn them into a superhero for their network. But it's a great way to meet people as well. So for me, as you can tell, 
I'm a huge fan. <laughs> well, I agree with you, Robin. And it's it's funny because I've only done a few of these now. I'm, I'm slowly building up our sort of library of podcasts before we're going to be launching it and, and actually putting it out there. So it's kind of funny right now. I'm having all these conversations and I'm thinking somebody I'm going to talk to next week, the podcast is going to be put out there for them maybe in July. But that's okay. As I'm doing this, it's, what, what I'm finding really cool about this is I'm actually, it's like professional development for me because I'm getting one-on-one time with people who have expertise who can share information with me that I might not otherwise get. So there's the benefit of me putting it out there and sharing it with people so they can learn, but I kind of get the sneak peek and I get to talk to people and learn from them all kinds of interesting and useful information that's a little piece of my own professional development. So you're right. The podcast has a lot of benefits and uh, and I certainly not only do I want it to be a growth opportunity for me, but I want it to be an opportunity for others to learn. And I think that's exactly the direction we're heading. And you've got a really interesting story. I mean, I have to say, I always enjoy hearing your story and, and we both have some similarities in, in, in how we kind of came up into becoming business owners. And both our fathers were involved in the insurance industry. Both of them were brokers. And so it's great to feel that connection around that. And so all of what we've talked about at this point, I think does set the stage quite nicely for why I wanted to have you on the show. As you know, the work that we do is all about resolving conflict. And in my opinion, the costs associated with having to deal with conflicts in the workplace is, is really staggering for some businesses. I mean, I, I talked to some large organizations that set aside literally hundreds of thousands of dollars to deal with issues around harassment and discrimination and conflict within their organization. And I think a, a big part of trying to prevent this, because that's really what organizations need to start doing. We can't be reactive to these things. We have to find ways exactly. to problems, right? And so one of the ways of doing that is to create healthy working environments, right? So people feel healthy, they feel safe, and we have to take care of our employees. And so I I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what are some of the unique benefit ideas that can really help employers make a happier and healthier environment for their employees? Dean, here we are sitting as business owners. And I don't know if you chat with friends, but I have one friend in particular. We get together every Christmas because he's super busy with his life and I'm super busy with his life. And I went the route of entrepreneurship and he went the route of, you know, salary job, but he's got all the perks, the beautiful pension and benefits and, and share purchase. And I routinely hear, Rob, you're so lucky you run your own business. And as you're asking this question, you know, what you can do for your employees, sometimes I think back and said, yeah, am I lucky? I guess I am some days, but there's a lot that comes with that, right? And especially as you grow a company, there's that added pressure because now you're responsible for other people and their well-being and and, and you want to do everything in your, in your power. So like you, I run my own firm and I think that's one of the advantages that I have over some of my counterparts. And I'd never say anything bad about anyone. There's so many great employee benefit consultants and and brokers. I'm a member of the CGIB, which is the Canadian Group Insurance Broker Association. And I talk to guys and gals across the country and there's some fantastic people. But, you know, I guess one of the advantages, I'm a business owner. I run a company. I'm not a sole proprietorship and our company is growing. So, you know, when I'm going in to talk with the client or a prospective client, I get it. I have the same issues as you. I want to drive that engagement. And of course, March 18th was March 18th for us last year. We sent the employees home. And so this awesome culture that we built within the four walls, I thought, okay, now how are we going to do it? And of course, I wasn't the only one facing this. And you know what's interesting, Dean? I've been doing this for 25 years. And I talked about launching our company in in 2005, but I started in the business in 1996. And here's what I'm finding. And I think this is going to be incredibly important. And I think it relates to your point as well. I've walked into companies with a really good culture. People are feeling positive about their benefits plan. And then we look at their benefits plan because we're doing an analysis. That's okay. But they got this great culture. And then I've walked into other companies where they have this, you know, bells and whistles, this amazing plan, but their culture stinks and the employee's perception of the plan stinks. So over the years through, you know, having these conversations, what I've discovered is the difference between those two cultures and those two examples every single time has been communication, right? Mm-hmm. And that's become even more important now because I was reading an article in, it was a US magazine, but the numbers will hold the same for Canada. And we're experiencing the same thing. 25% in this report, 25% of workers plan to leave their job 
their current job for new opportunities post COVID. That number is huge. Mm -hmm. And so that war for talent, and I said, we're experiencing the same thing. We are hiring for a position. We have a, someone who is professional, very good at, you know, what they do, doing the whole top grading interview style. We got two people. We found two people. I was looking at stats on, on a seminar. I deal with a lot of SaaS clients in SaaS. And in one day, there was 320,000 job postings in one day. Wow! So creating that culture, creating that engagement, making sure we don't have good people leave, because as you know, Dean, finding that people takes time and money. Training that person to a point where they become profitable to your company takes, depending on the company, quite a bit of time. And then losing that person, that's painful, right? So what my company does is how do we make sure it's really easy for people to walk into that culture and feel comfortable and think, hey, this is a great benefits plan. And then on the opposite side, how do we make it really difficult for those people to walk out the door? And I'll get back to communication because I think that's really important. And communication is a buzzword. Hey, let's communicate the plan and then that's it. But really what we encourage employers to do, and it's not specifically directed at employee benefits, although certainly we can help with that in terms of topics, creating that cadence of communication. And it can be a little thing. And I'll give you an example. And, and if the, if your listeners find it helpful, then, then I'm happy. I've done a good job here then with my direct report that I deal with every single day. From 9.15 to 9.30, we have a daily huddle every single day. And that's especially important now because she's working remote for the first time in, I think, 10 years for her. And as said to me, feels disconnected from the rest of the team. But at the very least, her and I connect every day. And what we talk about is three things. We say, let's focus on a positive. So a customer success, how we help someone in the previous day. What are you stuck on? And that I can potentially or another team member can help you on. And what's your action item of the day? And I found since we implemented that, the engagement I get, and she'll even, she'll joke around. She's been with me for a long time. It's a great working relationship. She says, I look forward to those meetings. So again, you know, that communication, we started uh, this week, we've been doing it for a while, but we have our team meeting. And again, the rule for the team meeting is you come to that meeting with something positive, either personally or professionally. What are you stuck on? The team can help you with and what are your action items? Well, this week we started as you're entering the room, we've got an upbeat song playing. So because I, I started this this week, it was my song choice and I got it going and it was everyone is upbeat and it sets the tone for the week. Because I was choosing this week, I get to pick the person who chooses next week. And it's entirely up to them. So all of these little things that you can do to create this culture where people feel comfortable, they feel safe, they feel it's a, you know it's an open door policy. All of those things are important. But again, and I'm going to sound like a broken record, and I'm sure, I'm sure clients and prospects that have talked to me, well, this will sound very familiar. But again, I always go back to that communication. And from my perspective, if I'm walking into a brand new prospect and they have an existing plan today without doing full discovery, I don't know if there's an opportunity to help them or not. But one of the things I usually tell them is, I guarantee you there are things on your benefits plan today that you can communicate to your employees that is going to have value for them and is going to make them feel better about where they work and will not cost you a dime. You know, it's, it's funny when you talk about communication, it's really interesting because if I had to pick one thing, as you know, we do a lot of investigations and a lot of mediations and we're, we're resolving conflict. And I can tell you that if I had to pick one item that was at the heart of probably 80% of the stuff that we investigate or mediate, it's going to be poor communication. So not only is it something you need to focus on in order to enhance the culture, in order to make the workplace happier and healthier, but it can also be the biggest problem that you experience within the workplace. So communication, you're absolutely right. When you talk about the importance of communication, I agree 100%. It's huge. Yeah, I agree. So let me give you a couple of examples. And hopefully if your audience has, has a running a company and they have a benefits plan, they're going to know this is there. So on most plans in Canada, there's something called best doctors or something very similar. It's a second opinion, medical service. And if you're unsure about it, just ask your, ask your broker, ask your HR person. But we had a client years ago, name was John, typical family, husband, two kids, this sort of thing, growing up, going through his career, all of a sudden, something's not right. Goes to the doctor, diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You can imagine 
I mean, I can't even imagine, to be honest. And so his, his whole world blows up. Because of best doctors, they came back and they said, his doctor has diagnosis, you know, you're terminal, here's what's going to happen, get your life in order. Because he had this through his plan, this best doctor's program, they actually, and I won't get into the nitty gritty, but they order their own unstayed slides of the biopsy and they look at the diagnosis and the treatment and all this kind of thing. They had actually come back to him, Dean, and said, hey, there's an experimental program, not a proven candidate yet, but we can get you on the trial. So he got into the trial. He ends up living eight years longer than they thought he would. And what does that mean to him? Well, as a result, takes those family vacations, sees both of his kids graduate school. I get emotional talking about this one because this one's close to heart. He walks his daughter down the aisle. I mean, amazing. And this is something that is on most plans, but nobody talks about Dean. And you can talk to to plan members and employees about dental and the importance of you know, your penicillin covered. To me, these are the stories and this is where insurance really has something positive to talk about. So I encourage everybody to talk about that. The other big one right now, it's a huge theme, is mental health concerns in the workplace. That is a huge right. one right now. And I was looking at an RBC report yesterday that saw a 49% increase in psychotherapist claims over the last year. So every HR person out there knows there is a clear link between an employee's well-being and their mental health and productivity. So that's a huge red flag. So, you know, what can you do around that? Well, some carriers have embedded EAPs into the program, employee assistance programs, and there's definitely a mental health aspect there. You've got companies like Sun Life out there who have developed the mental health toolkit, which is free to all Canadians. You've got another company called Deacon, which again is access to cognitive behavioral therapy that I believe is free access as well. Don't quote me there, but I know they have a lot of free programs there. And then you look on the other side at virtual healthcare platforms, which have grown incredibly, obviously due to COVID-19. But if you look at companies like Dialogue, and Dialogue I had on, I remember the date because it was February 5th, 2019. I had them on the podcast back then. This was pre-COVID and they were coming to the market with a virtual healthcare platform. And I thought, well, this is an interesting company. Well, they recently had their IPO. The company has exploded. So the reason why I'm bringing that company up is they do virtual healthcare, but they've got such a strong representation on the mental health side of things that we're beginning to talk to a lot of clients about that as well. And I think that breaks down those barriers that have traditionally been there, Dean, making it super easy for someone to like we're chatting today via our computers or your laptop or your smartphone, whatever is going to be most comfortable for you. So I think things like that, there's other freebies you can do out in the marketplace that again, will make you look good to your employees, make them feel good about what they're doing. There's companies like Pocket Pills out there, the digital pharmacy platform. I put it into my program. I had an employee come back, say, hey, during COVID, you're putting this in place. I can't believe it. This is wonderful. Again, didn't cost me a dime, but it makes me look good. So I'm a fan of all those, of course. Last one I would say, you can put in a group RSP. I mean, this is another thing that we're hearing, financial literacy and and help around planning for retirement. This is what plan members are asking for. And I think a lot of employers think that it's going to be some complex program to put in place. It couldn't be easier. You can put in a group RSP tomorrow and it won't cost you a dime. The only time it ends up costing an employer money is if you want to put in the contribution, which we always recommend because then you're going to get bigger uptake. So I guess my message around this, Dean, is there is so much you can do under the heading of communication, and you don't even necessarily need to be spending more money because, you know, let's face it, many of us are tightening our belts right now. So maybe maybe we're not in a position to, to spend more money, but there's definitely things that you can do. And of course, you know, talk to your broker, talk to, you know, your HR people. If you want to talk to me, I nerd out on this stuff. So I'm always happy to chat. But again, I think there's lots of things that we can do. And to your point, to prevent rather than react down the road and and have a bigger issue on your head. Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting, the virtual healthcare thing that's really cool. I mean, as you know, this podcast is designed to appeal to workplace individuals, you know, various individuals that either run a business or work in human resources or whatever, but we also work a lot with regulators. And one of the interesting things around the virtual healthcare is, for example, I happen to work with an organization called MedCan. And 
MedCan is, they offer virtual healthcare services and that really works well for me because I travel a lot. But what's interesting is, is if I travel out of the country, then if I'm physically out of the country, believe it or not, there are regulatory issues that can get in the way of doctors, for example, providing their services when you're not in the country because they're essentially practicing medicine outside the boundaries of where they're licensed to practice or registered to practice. So what I see with all of this is this technology grows, it's going to be necessary for regulators to catch up and start looking at ways that regulatory bodies in different jurisdictions can maybe work together, provide some reciprocity or something like that. Because again, COVID and the pandemic has, there's certain things aren't going to change. We're not going to go back exactly to the way things were. We're going to do no, exactly. stuff virtually. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of change to come, I believe. I agree. I was, I was reading a report the other day that, and it was a consumer report and it was in financial services, but 90% of the people reporting the survey said they would prefer to do these types of transactions in a virtual setting, which is good for you know my car lease because I'm not nearly putting in as many kilometers as I used to on, but it's going to be interesting to see what happens because I like you doing the face-to-face. I remember coming out to your office and commenting on the Muhammad Ali picture on the wall. And so I, you know, I'll miss that type of thing. But again, I, I think you're right. There's just certain things we're never going to go back to. And, and you either adapt and move forward or you get left behind, unfortunately. Yeah, you're right. And you know what, Robin, I hate to say it. I, I could talk to you all day about all this stuff, but uh, I could too. I, I think it's great. You've offered some really good and really interesting insights, I think, on a lot of what can be done in workplaces and particularly around the benefits side of things. And, you know, what I like to do with this podcast is, is have a little bit of a discussion around people's interests as well, because, because I think it's interesting to get to know people. And I know that you have some pretty eclectic interests and we even have some in common. I know we both like to travel and we're both interested in the, what I like to call the pugilistic arts, but uh, <laughs> having listened to all the great information you've provided, I think the listeners might like to know a little bit about what Robin does when he isn't in work mode. Which, by the way, folks, is not as often as you might think, because this man is one of the hardest working men I know. But what can you tell us about what Robin does when he's not helping people with their benefits and and all the other things that you do? Thank you for that. I appreciate that. And, and yeah, if if I'm here, my my general rule is if I'm in the country that I am working, much to my wife's chagrin, and and this is why pre-COVID she used to constantly say, "Unless we book a trip, you're not going to stop." So I have to get you on out of the country. And but that is. You know, that's one thing that I that I really value is we have traveled quite a bit. And obviously, there's a bit of a stall right now, but hopefully we get back to that soon. But my wife, I'm blessed in that my wife, she's an amazing person in that she creates these experiences. And Dean, I've, I've shared some of these with you. You know, we were, we were flying into Amsterdam and, of course, getting a car into the hotel and you're driving through the city and you see these beautiful canals and waterways. And I see this beautiful patio right by the water and sunshine and there's people out there enjoying and, you know, having a beer. And I said, Oh, I want to go somewhere like that. And of course she doesn't say anything. And again, like my business partner, she has a great poker face. And of course with Europe, as it is the flight times, you know, you get to the hotel and the room's not ready yet, of course, but it's coming up around lunchtime. And I said, well, what are we going to do? Well, we'll leave the bags here. Let's go. And I said, well, where are we going? She goes, don't worry about it. And we're zigzagging through streets and over bridges and through canals. And wouldn't you know it? She took me to that patio that I had pointed out from the car. And that was quite a few years ago now, that trip. And, and it just, again, it's those experiences that we have. And, and I'm very grateful to my wife. She does plan these experiences. Aside from traveling, yes, we do share the love of the martial arts, although you're a much better boxer than me. I shied away from boxing the moment I took a, a heavy right cross and I thought, yeah, I don't, I don't like getting hit in the face so much. So <laughs> I always lean more towards Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I did that for a lot of years. I still have a love for that. For me, that world has changed a lot and the mixed martial arts have really evolved, but I would encourage anyone, if, especially if you are looking to level the playing field from a pure self-defense standpoint, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is fantastic because it does really allow that smaller, weaker person use leverage and technique to defend against that stronger, you know, more aggressive attacker. But I retired about two years ago, and I think I got out just in time. Hopefully, my my training partners won't hear that, but they'll be disappointed. But I was starting to feel my body give out a little bit deep. 
and uh, my back and my neck, especially. And, and that is very common in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu if you do it long enough and, and if you do it enough. And I, and I was very addicted to it. But one of the things I'll say, Dean, is, and I think whether you're talking about boxing or Muay Thai or karate, any kind of martial art, one of the things that I love that it teaches and what I've used it to apply to business is it forces you to face adversity. I would be on the mats when I retired. I was a third degree purple belt, but I routinely rolled with other purple belts and brown belts and black belts and professors. And these guys were killers. I mean, off the mats and once we're done, hey, we're all friends, but on the mats, they're trying to strangle me or tap me out. And, you know, facing that adversity, I think is so important because it teaches you, you know, it builds character and it shows you that, hey, life is not that path to victory is not going to be always smooth. And sometimes you will have to tap out and come back and fight another day. And, and I think I've always applied that to business and saying something worthwhile and that path to victory, again, maybe is not going to happen the way I think it's going to happen. I'm going to face things along the way. But just like martial arts, you don't let it stop you. You figure out what you did wrong, you change your approach, and you try something else. And then if it doesn't work, you change that approach again, Think about what you did wrong and move on. So I think I think martial arts has been incredibly important in the develop of, of who I am, who I've become, and ultimately the business. These days, I've transitioned that into fitness. I still love pushing myself. I work out five days a week. It is scheduled into my calendar. It has to happen no matter what. If my day got away from me and it happened to be midnight, doesn't matter. That workout has to happen. So those are my loves. I would say my last one would be podcasting. I am a huge fan of podcasting. I consume podcasts every single day. I don't listen to music in my car. Again, much to my wife's disappointment. And I love I love podcasting and having conversations like this. So, But I want to thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your show. And I can't wait to hear your other guests because I know uh, you're connected with a lot of great people. And I wish you the very best and uh, continued success, Dean. Well, thank you so much, Robbie. And one common theme in a lot of those interests that you have is the theme of discipline and sacrifice, right? Those two things factor into many things we do. So I agree with you in terms of the the carryover. And it's probably one of the reasons that you are as successful as you are, my friend. But you thank me. I also want to thank you for joining me today. You really did share some great ideas and some potential solutions for our audience. And it really was a pleasure speaking to you. And I know that people are going to want to connect with you. So how can they best reach you? Yeah, Robin Bailey on LinkedIn. I mean, that's my platform. That's where I live and breathe. So I love conversations. I joke around with people. I said, I'm really good at coffee. Although that's virtual coffee these days, I love having conversations. Again, I go back to the feedback that came back after my dad passed away and I realized I'm walking in those footsteps. So I feel pretty proud. Now that that really is great, Robin. With that, I guess we have to wrap up. Uh, All good things must come to an end. So that is a wrap for this show, everyone. Thanks again for listening and please do send us your feedback on how we're doing. I say this at the end of every show, our goal here, as with all we do, is constant and never-ending improvement. And we need your feedback to do that. So all our podcasts get linked to our website, bernardinc.com. You can always reach me at uh, dbernard at bernardinc.com or Dean Bernard on LinkedIn. We really appreciate you listening and we'll see you next time on the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.